Hey everybody, and welcome to the June lecture. So we're halfway through the year for our lecture series. Uh, and today we're going to be talking about, um, we're going to finish off uh, our discussion of early bushflying and development of aviation in the 30s, and then how it transitioned, um, how it survived the Great Depression essentially, largely to the efforts of James Richardson, and how we developed into um, essentially the first airlines. So we'll cover most of the 30s and end up uh, essentially 1939, just before the First World War. Sorry, the Second World War. Next month, uh, we're gonna next two months in July and August, we're gonna be talking about um, the Second World War. So first, we're gonna go overseas and we're gonna talk about mainly Edmontonians that served overseas, and then in August, we're gonna come back to Edmonton and talk about uh, the war effort at home, mainly with the British Commonwealth Air Training Plan and people that served here number 16 EFTS, and number two ALS, uh, and also um, the Northwest Staging Route and, and all of the efforts on the other side of the airport. So we'll split it up and then in September we'll come back and talk about Cold War military, uh, and then in October we'll come back and talk about civilian flying again. So we'll, we'll have several months of military after today. So we talked about Western Canada Airways, which was James Richardson's company, came coming out of Winnipeg, uh, and how they hired a lot of famous early bush pilots, including Punch Dickens. So a lot of the early bush pilots, uh, or famous bush pilots, got their start with Western Canada Airways. So WCA spread across Western Canada, and they established regular passenger mail service throughout the prairies. Uh, this is a brochure that's listing some of their routes and rates, uh, and when you look at it, know that prices due to inflation are about 20 times higher in 2022 compared to 1931 due to inflation. So when you look at uh, a flight from Winnipeg to Edmonton, which is $46 one way in 1931, the equivalent when you factor in inflation is $950.46 today. Very much not a service that most everyday people could afford. So uh, it, was, it was quite expensive and restricted a lot to government officials, church officials, um, businesses, prospectors, but just not an everyday, oh, I'm just gonna fly across the country and go visit my aunt kind of thing. We talked about Watt May and his commercial airways, of course, which had run into financial difficulties. So they reluctantly joined Richardson's company, which rebranded as Canadian Airways Limited. So one of his most famous exploits at this time as uh, after he joined Canadian Airways was the hunt for the Mad Trapper. Albert Johnson was a trapper. Uh, he arrived in Fort McPherson in July of 1931 and he was questioned immediately by the local RCMP officials uh, by a constable named Edward Millen. But uh, he kind of gave them a weird vibe. He was generally fairly uncooperative. They report that he might have had a Scandinavian accent but uh, he was such a loner and he kept to himself so much that this is kind of unconfirmed. He was fairly well off, um, he outfitted himself well, and he ended up, ended up building an 80 square foot cabin on the Rat River. Oddly though, he hadn't acquired a trapping license, which was considered odd um, for somebody that was experienced at living on the land. In December of that year, 1931, local indigenous trappers started complaining to the Eklavik RCMP uh, with this Johnson character messing up their traps, manually tripping them, hanging them in trees, uh, making them useless. These accusations, interestingly enough, were later investigated more thoroughly by the RCMP, and they kind of concluded that these uh, claims were probably heavily exaggerated. And because of the depression, uh, there was a lot of people um, trying their hand at trapping, and there was a lot of pressure on the local area and a lot of competition. So they were becoming quite crowded, and there was possibly some attempt to essentially sabotage people to um, keep, keep others away. Uh, in any case, in, on Boxing Day of 31, uh, RCMP Constable Alfred King and Special Constable Joe Bernard trekked the 100 kilometers to Johnson Cabin to ask him about these allegations of tampering with the traps. So they get to his cabin, and there's smoke that's coming out of the chimney, so he's obviously home. But uh, when they go to the cabin, they knock on the door, and they get absolutely no response. They knock again, again, no response. So they peek in the window and they see that, yeah, he's there, he's ignoring them, and he ends up just taking a sack and covering up the window, which is making them fairly suspicious. So, but there's nothing they can really do about it at the time. So they hike the 100 kilometers all the way back to Eklavik and get a search warrant. 
So five days later, they come back with uh, two other guys. Johnson again refused to talk and completely ignored them. So eventually King decides, well, I'm going to enforce this warrant and force the door open. So as soon as he tried forcing the door open, Johnson shot him through the door. Uh, there was a brief firefight that broke up, broke out between the RCMP and Johnson. Um, and then the team managed to get the wounded Constable King back to Oklavik, where he eventually recovered. So the RCMP then got a posse together uh, of about nine men, 42 dogs, uh, and they brought 20 pounds of dynamite with them, which they were going to use to blast open the cabin uh, if necessary, if he, if he was going to come out. So they, they trek, mush, trek or mush all the way uh, back, these 100 kilometers back to his cabin. Uh, they are needing to keep the dynamite warm inside their coats. They light up the dynamite, they chuck it on the roof of the cabin, and detonates and, and damages the, the roof of the cabin. And after that, Johnson decides he's had enough, so he starts uh, opening fire. He's got a dugout, uh, a five-foot dugout beneath his cabin, and he's fairly protected by the ruins of his cabin. So this long firefight breaks out, um, nobody's hit, and it ends up being about a 15-hour standoff in minus 40 degree weather. So the posse decides they've had enough of that, they retreat back to Klavik and they decide, okay, we need we need more help. Uh, there was a, a really bad blizzard at the time, so uh, the larger reinforced posse wasn't able to get back to Johnson's cabin until January 14th. And uh, they get there and they decide that, or sorry, they, they discover that he's abandoned the cabin. So they start chasing after him. They, they finally catch up to him on January 30th, so almost just more than two weeks later. Uh, they surround him in a thicket, and there's another firefight that breaks out. And during that firefight, he shoots Constable Millen through the heart and ends up killing him. So Johnson leaves, uh, gets away from the posse, and it's pretty obvious that he's decided to head for the Yukon. Um, so the Royal Canadian, the Mounted Police, block the only two passes over the Richardson Mountains, knowing that he's going to come through one of those two passes to get to the Yukon. But that doesn't stop him, and he ends up climbing a 7,000-foot peak and uh, ignores the passes and then once again disappears. So the RCMP are, are fairly desperate at this time. They don't have a lot of leads, um, so they turn to Wat May. So he's in a clavic delivering airmail, and they go to him and say, hey, we really need help with this manhunt. Can you please scout from the air and see if you can find any tracks or any sign of campfires or, or any sign of this guy uh, going into, uh, into the Yukon. Uh, and he's flying the Belanca CH-300 uh, on skis. So it's a very, very capable bush aircraft. Uh, it's the middle of winter, so there's not really any concerns about uh, where they can go. So he starts scouting from the air, and he discovered that he was the one that discovered that Johnson had crossed over the Richardson Mountains. Uh, so the aircraft had saw his tracks on the far side of the range. On Valentine's Day, so February 14th, um, he tracked down uh, the, the trail again and noticed a set of footprints that was leading off from the center of a frozen um, river uh, to the bank of the river. It turns out that Johnson had actually been following the caribou tracks um, so that they would essentially hide his tracks. So he was you know, doing a, a very concentrated effort to uh, lose any, any people that were following him. Uh, the snow was actually also quite compacted, so it ended up in, he was able to go pretty quickly without using uh, snowshoes. So Ray gets on the sorry May gets on the radio, radios back to the RCMP, and uh, they give chase. So they eventually catch up to to Johnson on February seventeenth. So they get to this uh, around the bend of this river, and they spot him just like a couple hundred yards ahead, and Johnson panics tries to run for the bank, um, but he doesn't have his snow snowshoes on, uh, so he doesn't make it. So again, another firefight breaks out uh, between the RCMP and Johnson. Uh, another officer is very seriously wounded, and then Johnson is ended up, you know, ends up getting killed um, when he's shot. So because of this RCMP officer that's been very heavily wounded, May ends up landing the plane on the river, picks up the officer and the body of the mad trapper, and he flies them back uh, and is credited with saving this uh, officer's life. This story was very famous at the time. It was covered by in the radio, covered in the newspaper, and it really helped contribute to Wat May's reputation as a very capable pilot um, and kind of remade him famous yet again. So 
with the Great Depression kind of ramping up, it started putting a greater squeeze on aviation. And mainly the first indication of, of trouble uh, was rumors in February of 1932 that the airmail service was going to be abandoned by the federal government uh, because of money considerations. So the, the prairie airmail route that they'd already set up. So sure enough, uh, Conservative Prime Minister Bennett announced that they were cutting airmail funding from $5.4 million to $1.7 million as a money-saving measure. And such a huge cut and such a small amount of money meant that uh, that, that small amount of money would be spread around between these various operators, uh, and obviously a lot of these air routes would get canceled. So it was made official on March 31st. Um, that the airmail contract was cancelled with two years remaining on that original four-year contract. And a lot of these early airlines and bush operations had really built up their companies on the assumption that this contract was going to be honored and in place for a couple of years and, and hopefully build on it. So Richardson's Canadian Airways was um, in a really tough spot because they bought a lot of equipment, they had property leases, they were contracted for that full four years. So the company kind of had to suck it up and take that financial hit without any relief for the next two years. And at the time, there wasn't really a lot of public support for Prairie Air Mail, so the government was using it as an excuse that, well, it was a, it was a good idea, but it wasn't particularly well used, and um, you know there was not enough use to make it really profitable. And at the time, the government was making um, a lot of changes to air regulations across the country um, that were really stymieing a lot of early bush operations and really frustrated Richardson in particular. Uh, and some of the government officials that were making these changes obviously didn't do any consulting with aviation companies and were making decisions that really had a really strong impact on these bush operations without fully understanding the impact of, of what they were doing. So moving away from Mott May for a bit, uh, the last time I think we talked about Lee Britnell. He'd been a flying instructor for the Royal Flying Corps in the First World War. After that, he came back to Canada and he worked for the Ontario Provincial Air Service from 1924 to 1927. And then like pretty much everybody else, uh, he went to work for Western Canada Airways, just James Richardson's company. Uh, he's a very capable, capable manager. So Richardson made him the superintendent of WCA's base in Hudson, Ontario. So he's flying as a pilot, he's working as a manager. Um, when WCA ends up uh, becoming Canadian Airways, he transfers to Canadian Airways, and he becomes the assistant general manager of, um, of Canadian. But he decides that, uh, you know, because he's a capable, ma capable manager and he has his own ideas for how things should be run, that he wants to start up his own aviation company. So he resigns from his position in 1931 and decides to come up with a new company called McKenzie Air Services. So he forms McKenzie Air Services in Edmonton in 1931, and uh, it took about a year to get everything operational, excuse me, and he starts flying passengers into the Northwest Territories and the Arctic in 1932. So at the time in Edmonton, uh, Canadian Airways has uh, their headquarters in the Richardson Building downtown, which is formerly the uh, Union Bank now the Union Bank Inn. Uh, Canadian has about seven aircraft in Edmonton at the time. Uh, a Lockheed Vega, two Yonkers 34s, two Blanca Pacemakers, uh, a Fairchild 2 WC2, and a Fairchild 71, which is ATZ, which is the aircraft on our logo and the one in the museum. McKenzie Air, Versus, McKenzie Air Service is much smaller. They have um, a Curtis Robin, so ALZ, uh, sorry, uh, and AKN, which is a Fairchild 71, and a super universal. So he obviously needs more larger aircraft, more capable aircraft. So Lee ends up going to Belanca in Delaware for something larger. He comes back with AWR, which is later named, known as the Eldorado Radium Silver Express in March of 1934. This Belanca is an absolutely enormous aircraft and it's powered by a Wright Cyclone engine of 730 horsepower. Uh, so I am very lucky to find this photo with Britnell standing in front of the aircraft because you really get a sense for just how ridiculously large it is. In the 1920s, uh, Eldorado Gold Mines Limited opened the first, uh, sorry, opened the world's second uranium oxide mine at Port Radium in the Northwest Territories uh, and a refinery at Port Hope, Ontario for radium. Uh, 
Radium at the time was used in cancer treatment and it was super expensive. So it's about $50,000 US per gram. Or if you take inflation into account, that's almost a million dollars a gram in today's money. But the big challenge was like that huge distance between the mine and the refinery. And uh, that journey over the water and rails was a combination of about 6,000 kilometers. Uh, and the water segment of that trip was about 1,500 miles. Um, and for a lot of the year, the lakes and rivers on that route were frozen. So it really limited their operations. So the owners of the mine uh, were really looking for an all season transportation route uh, to get their product from the mine to the railhead. And the solution was Mackenzie Air Services and this Belanca. So the Belanca Air Cruiser, it's a high wing, single engine aircraft. Um, it's a single wing, but uh, these struts on the lower, uh, these this big flying W struts um, also provide a bit of lift. Uh, and it's a super capable workhorse um, intended for either passenger or cargo use. Um, they only made about 23 of them. Uh, it could operate on wheels, skis or, flo skis or floats like any other capable bush plane. Uh, it originally had a water-cooled engine, but it was changed to an air-cooled engine, uh, which is obviously a much better idea in the bush. And it could carry 4,000 pounds or, um, you know, 8,800 kilograms, I'm sorry, 4,000 pounds or 2,000 kilograms uh, at speeds of about 155 miles an hour. Uh, very characteristic W shape, so very interesting uh, plane to spot in, in photographs. So AWR was built in 1935, and it was the first of five Belancas used in Canada. Operated for El Dorado exclusively by originally Mackenzie Air Service. Uh, this was the second largest aircraft operating in Canada at the time. So in March of 35, Brent Nell and uh, Mackenzie Air Service pilot Stan McMillan took off from the El Dorado site in this air cruiser carrying the first shipment of radium and uh, they brought the rink, sorry, they brought the ore to the rail link at Waterways Fort McMurray. Uh, so it was immediately a successful operation uh, and really paved the way for um, mining flights into the north. In 1939, uh, this aircraft was transferred to Canadian Airways, um, and it remained in the service of El Dorado until the mine closed in 1940, um, and then operated with, with other operators. Uh, it crashed in 1947 while carrying a shipment of uranium concentrate uh, in northern Ontario, very seriously damaged and abandoned. Um, I haven't seen it myself, but uh, this is a, the world's last flying example of the Belanca uh, at an air show. If you look at this video up on YouTube, uh, it's got a complete video showing the interior of the aircraft. Unfortunately, it's a really wide angle, so it um, gives a bit of a distorted sense of what the aircraft is like. But uh, you can just see how fairly simple it is, um, how it's got a fairly cavernous interior, uh, and you really get a sense of um, this lifting body strut design uh, of the aircraft. Unfortunately, AWR uh, is not in the Alberta Aviation Museum. It is in the Winnipeg Aviation Museum. So it is on long-term restoration by them. Uh, obviously, if I had unlimited money, I would um, very nicely ask them if they would transfer it to us because uh, it obviously has a very strong connection to Edmonton uh, and it would look great in our collection. So Lee Brentnell's company uh, continued to, continue to expand after the success of this Eldorado radium uh, mine operation. So they were buying more aircraft, hiring more pilots, um, and they pioneered a lot of developments in the airline industry in the 1930s, like um, airborne communications. So they developed a series of stations from Edmonton to the Beaufort Sea by McKenzie. Um, and McKenzie himself really saw the potential of the North for um, commercial operations. And he really valued Edmonton's strategic location and uh, its easy, relatively easy access to Northern Canada. So he is, at least in a large part, responsible for getting the attention of oil companies, mining world, and the governments on Northern Canada uh, because of this Mackenzie Air Service operation. So Mackenzie Air Service operated from 1932 to 1940, uh, and then he sold it to the Canadian Pacific Railways Company and it became part of Pacific Canadian Pacific Air. Uh, 
Uh, this is a picture of him in his head office in the McDonald's Hotel. Pat McConaughey is a younger um, generation. He's born in Ontario in 1909, grows up in Calder, uh, and he worked various jobs with Canadian National Railways, uh, went to the University of Alberta, dropped out as a first-year student because he really wanted to take flying lessons from Moss Burbage at the Edmonton Flying Club. So he earned his private pilot license in 1929 at the Edmonton Flying Club, and his commercial license in 1930, uh, and then he decided to head to China to fly for the Chinese National Airways. And on his way there, he stopped off in Vancouver to visit his uncle. His uncle was very alarmed at this uh, idea that uh, Grant McConaughey was going to go to China and fly. Uh, China was at war with Japan at the time, so he thought it was particularly dangerous. So in order to dissuade him of this notion, his uncle decided, well, I'm just going to buy him his own aircraft and then he can start up his own business here. So he bought him a dilapidated secondhand Fokker Universal and he started up his own airline, Independent Airways, in 1931. So the first contract was flying fish from lakes in uh, northern Canada during and uh, obviously a very smelly operation. Uh, during the summer, he was barnstorming uh, in prairie communities. Uh, ran into a lot of financial setbacks, uh, physical hazards, declared bankruptcy, uh, was involved in an almost fatal crash, but um, managed to survive it. Uh, this is a picture of him and uh, Chris Green in front of their Fokker Universal. That Fokker Universal is one of the six that uh, Canada had bought for the 1927 Hudson Strait Expedition, um, including our museums, uh, which is uh, Gulf Alpha Hotel Echo. Ours, uh, so after the two years of the Hudson Strait Expedition, uh, the government sold the five surviving universals that hadn't crashed to private operators. Uh, Maritime and Newfoundland Airways purchased our aircraft in 1931, and uh, Zebulon Lewis Lee used, was using that aircraft in the Maritimes to fly freight, uh, including rum, from Sydney to the French islands of St. Pierre and Miquelon. His business failed, uh, so he ended up forming a new company called Explorers Air Transport, and he moved that Universal to Cooking Lake here in Alberta. Grant McConaughey bought it for United Air Transport in 1933. So Independent Airways failed after only about a year, managed to secure new funding, reformed as United Air Transport. So he was using this universal to haul fish and miners for the next four years. Uh, this particular aircraft snagged telephone wires at Peace River in 1939, uh, was severely damaged and trucked back to Cooking Lake and abandoned. And this is what it looks like today. I'd very much like to fix it up one day. This is an early United Air Transport Boeing Canada Model 40, um, which is a biplane mostly used for airmail services. Uh, and interestingly, this is the first aircraft that Boeing built that could carry passengers. In the background behind it is um, CFCBN, which is a de Havilland 60M, or Metal Moth, with the Edmonton Aero Club. Around this time, um, Margaret Rutledge, uh, who was born Margaret Fane in Edmonton in 1914, uh, he grew up in a family that was really interested in aviation. Um, her father had built his own glider, uh, and she became fascinated by planes and took lessons at the Edmonton and Northern Alberta Aero Club, um, earning her private pilot license in 1933. She ended up getting her commercial pilot license in 1935 uh, and became the first woman in Western Canada to get a commercial pilot license. She then moved to Vancouver and found another six uh, women that were also pilots. So Tosca Trasolini, Elma Gilbert, Jean Pike, Elizabeth Flaherty, uh, Margaret Fain is the next one, and then Rolly Moore and Eliane Roberge. They, became a, they began a chapter of the Amelia Earhart group known as the 99s uh, and formed an aerial display team called the Flying Seven. So they gave flying demonstrations uh, and they became a very famous aerial team. So much so that the RCAF um, ended up inviting them to a meeting, hoping to recruit them into the RCAF. But the RCAF didn't actually realize that they were women. So uh, that didn't unfortunately go anywhere. They wanted to serve in the RCAF um, in the outbreak of the Second World War, uh, but they were rejected. So instead, they ended up continuing their flying demonstrations and used it to raise funds for the RCAF. <laughs> 
So she also worked for Bridge River and Caribou Airways as a radio operator. Um, before the war, she'd been assigned um, to Zabalos, uh, which is a mining town. She was one of only three unmarried women in the town, uh, with a population of only 1,500. Uh, Ginger Coots ended up hiring her on the recommendation of Grant McConaughey, who was, uh, owned Yukon Southern Air Transport at the time. And thanks to this, um, she became kind of a local celebrity, uh, talking about the woman pilot that was operating the radio station. Unfortunately, she couldn't get a job as a pilot, but she did take over Ginger Coots' role of flying planes from isolated communities um, while working there. So she was flying aircraft as a pilot, but not as a necessarily commercial pilot. She wasn't taking passengers on regular flights. So her last flight uh, was with McConaughey. He invited her to um, join him on a, essentially a test flight of a Lockheed 14. With aviation really ramping up at Blatchford Field, um, especially after the excitement of the 1930 air show, um, the visits of Wiley Post, etc., it soon became pretty apparent that aviation was really outstripping the improvements of um, Blatchford Field. And a lot of uh, bush pilots have been operating from Cooking Lake east of Edmonton. They didn't have any dedicated facilities, only had essentially what they were able to build themselves. So they decided, they decided that um, Cooking Lake, which had been in operation since about 1926, really needed uh, its own permanent um, infrastructure. So this is an earlier photo, earlier photo from 1930 of Commercial Airways uh, Lockheed Vega on Cooking Lake. This is a satellite photo, or not satellite photo, an aerial photo um, from 1924 of Cooking Lake. And the seaplane base uh, is this in the background. Uh, today, this whole region uh, east of Edmonton, the Beaver Hills, has really had um, some severe changes uh, and the lake levels have massively, massively reduced since the 1920s. So the seaplane place uh, is no longer in operation and this entire lake here essentially no longer exists anymore. Uh, it's just a marsh. So to put it into context as to exactly where um, Cooking Lake is compared to Blatchford Field, uh, I've just got a bit of an animation here. So just east of Edmonton, uh, and this is the lake. So if you compare the satellite photo to uh, today, this entire region is essentially just swamp. So in 1933, uh, the city of Edmonton allocated about $5,000 and building started building an administration building, a movable dock, a slipway, uh, it's installed a five-ton crane for hoisting planes in and out of the water, um, and also put in a 2,500 foot by 100 foot grass landing strip to allow wheeled aircraft to land there and be able to be converted to, to floats or vice versa. They had teams of horses um, and graders. Uh, it took about three years and was finally completed in 1936. So the administration building was opened in 1936, and uh, it was a very nice building. Uh, had a stone fireplace, uh, seven guest rooms, and they hired uh, Robbie Robertson, the city of Edmonton rather, hired Robbie Robertson to be the first official caretaker of the Cooking Lake Airport. Now, and the Cooking Lake Airport doesn't necessarily get acknowledged um, in Edmonton very much. It's obviously Blatchard Field is the important visible airfield, but Cooking Lake was actually very important because uh, you know when you're flying into nor northern Canada there's so many lakes and rivers that are only accessible from a float plane. So to be able to fly from Southern Alberta, you also need a float plane base. So Cooking Lake was equally important compared to Blatchard Field. So the first official landing at the Cooking Lake seaplane base on, on the land side of things uh, was Lee Brentnell, who flew in in uh, this Fokker Atlantic F-14, uh, so CFAUD, in September of 1933. So he taxied to the lakeshore and uh, got the aircraft fitted with float pontoons uh, and those float pontoons are made by the McDonald Brothers of Winnipeg under license for Earl Dodge Osborne, EDO, uh, which is the primary maker for floats today. 
Fortunately, that aircraft um, later that year was going would be involved in Blatchard Field's first fatality. Matt Berry and his mechanic, Fred Hodgins, were uh, working on Mackenzie Air Service aircraft, um, and they took this aircraft for a test flight. They invited airport manager Jimmy Bell on board uh, to go for a ride. Immediately after, t after takeoff, um, they stalled, tail hit the ground, left wing drop, dug in, uh, the aircraft pancakes and catches fire. Jimmy Bell is thrown out of the aircraft, very badly injured, uh, his jaw is shattered. Matt Berry is on fire, he's rolling through the grass to put out the flames, um, but McKenzie, McKenzie Air Service's engineer, Fred Hodgins, is trapped inside. The member of the flying club runs over, pulls him out, um, but it's too late and, and he dies, becoming Blatchard Field's first aircraft fatality. So this is an image of that same aircraft um, with the floats. So as I said, a lot of the um, companies were operating out of uh, Cooking Lake, so you can see the Radium Silver Express in the background, uh, a Fairchild w, uh, FC2W2 in the foreground, um, and I think a Fairchild 71 in the background. I'd have to look that one up. Uh, this is a Watt May in uh, Canadian Airways Yonkers W34. So again, this aircraft primarily operated on floats. And this is at the time that uh, Watt May ends up moving back from Fort McMurray to Edmonton. One of Alberta's first medevac flights, uh, or one of the first recorded medevac flights in Alberta, occurred in August of 1932. So Walter and Gladys Hill uh, were from Fort McMurray, and they were told by their doctor that uh, they really should travel to Edmonton for medical assistance um, due to complications with Gladys's pregnancy. So they flew in a float-equipped Fokker Universal, uh, owned by Explorers Air Transport. Uh, they flew them into Cooking Lake, and... Uh, and basically in the nick of time, and the healthy baby boy was born about 10 minutes after they landed. Thankfully, there were no complications because they weren't at a hospital, uh, and the young family was transported to Edmonton uh, by ambulance just to make sure they were safe. This is a later photo of uh, them with Via May on the right at Lake Louise. In 1934, McConaughey brings in a Ford Tri-Motor from Ontario, uh, and this is kind of his first um, kind of famous deal. So he talks the owner of this used aircraft down from $55,000 to $2,500. Uh, and this is the first multi-engine aircraft to operate from Blatchard Field. So it's got room for nine passengers, uh, or if you're Grant McConaughey, uh, uh, quite a lot of fish. The aircraft at Blatchard Field start to get um, particularly crowded. Um, and that the cost overruns at the airport and the difficulty of putting in this infrastructure starts to weigh pretty heavily on the city. Uh, Hangar 1 at the time is still not hooked up with natural gas um, and space is obviously at a, a premium. They rent out the, the Edmonton Flying Club rents out their machine shop to McKenzie Air Services uh, and their aircraft are v super busy at this time. So uh, their moth YYG, which is the one in the museum, has 1557 hours by this time. So Narsal goes up to uh, Winnipeg and picks up the Melamoth, which is the one that I so showed earlier. And that's a compassionate grant from the federal government. But it seems becoming clear, uh, especially to the operators at Blatchford Field and somewhat to the city, that uh, they really need to expand services at Blatchford Field. The next big aircraft to come in is AXE, which Con Conway Farrell brings in for Canadian Airways. Uh, and this is a Fairchild 82. So it's like a souped up version of the Fairchild 71. Uh, so he brings it in fresh from the factory in Quebec in 1936. It's about 20% larger than the 71, with room for two pilots sitting side by side. Uh, and like the 71, the wings fold back uh, so that it will actually fit into Hangar 1, which is a pretty important feature at the time. In 1936, Mackenzie Air Service brings in a Nordine Norseman, uh, which is a Canadian bush plane designed very specifically for the Canadian North by Robert Nordine who had earlier designed the Fokker Universal. It's a large aircraft, uh, the wingspan's almost 60 feet. Uh, it's very specifically built for conditions in Canada. Uh, it's got interior, interior heating, insulation, fairly comfortable ride. Uh, it's got room for nine passengers on bench seats or six in proper chairs, uh, and it can, or it can carry about 1,800 pounds of cargo. Uh, this is also the first aircraft to operate with wing flaps. 
uh, which is going to become a very important feature for short takeoff and landing characteristics. So it provides extra lift uh, and allows the aircraft to fly at slower speeds for takeoff and landing. So particularly important in short fields or small um, lakes and rivers. Uh, but yeah, Mackenzie doesn't have its own hangar. They are renting, or they have a, an, a shop downtown, which is now Alport's auto body. So all of their aircraft are disassembled and taken downtown, including the um, large Blanca, and worked on down there. But it seems to become clear that uh, this is not a particularly efficient system, and they really need to, to ramp things up. So the city decides in 1936 that, okay, they really do need to buy and build a new hangar. Um, this hangar costs $45,000, and they've been operating on grass strips from this time, so they really need to install permanent gravel runways. As long as possible, 200 feet wide, uh, and topped with the tar from Fort McMurray, at a total cost of $225,000. The city's coming under a lot of pressure from the federal government, and particularly C.D. Howe, uh, as well as a new lobbying group in Alberta called the Alberta and Northwest Chamber of Mines. Um, this lobbying group argues that the airport is providing $653,000 in value every year. Uh, United Air Transport the previous year hauled 777,000 pounds of freight. Mackenzie Air Services and Canadian carried 561,000 pounds of mail and almost 4,000 passengers. Um, and that's just the those you know passenger operators. There's also uh, a lot of mining operations are also using the airport. So they're, they're arguing that investing in the airport is going to pay dividends uh, for everybody that's using it. 1937 uh, is the start of Edmonton to Whitehorse Mail Service. Uh, this is with a different Ford Tri-Motor, BEP, with United Air Transport. This aircraft uh, is the float of this aircraft is the giant float that we have in uh, restoration at the museum. So as Canadian Airways was expanding their operations at the time and opening up new work routes, um, bush pilots were promoted into managerial positions. So Punch Dickens was appointed superintendent of Northern Operations. Uh, Watt May, who was chief pilot, was then promoted to superintendent of the McKenzie District uh, with the headquarters in Edmonton. Um, so after they moved back to Edmonton, their son Denny May was born on the 15th of May, 1936. This is also the year that Watt May started having such excruciating pain in his eye from the metal shard that had uh, ended up in his eye when he was working on a lathe that uh, he realized he really couldn't keep it a secret any longer and he had surgery to remove the eye and was permanently grounded and not allowed to fly again. This is a uh, 1938 schedule for Canadian Airways. Uh, and again, it shows um, some of the extreme costs. So a one-way flight from Edmonton to Fort McMurray cost $25 in 1938, which is the equivalent of $464 today. Not super unreasonable, but pretty expensive. Uh, whereas if you wanted to go somewhere super remote, like Herschel Island, it cost $300, which is equivalent to almost $5,600 today. So again, very expensive, not a service that everybody can uh, can necessarily afford. I mentioned C.D. Howe earlier. Uh, he's an engineer and he's a businessman. Uh, he's built a lot of green elevators across the country. And he ends up getting recruited by William Lyon Mackenzie King in 1934 as a liberal and he runs in Port Arthur. Wins by a landslide and he's appointed the Minister of Railways and Canals and the Minister of Marine. He worked with Canadian National Railways uh, to make them financially stable and reformed it into an official Crown Corporation. Uh, he also formed CBC as a Crown Corporation and then decided that his next step was airlines. So in 1936, the supervision of, of uh, civil aviation was transferred from the Department of National Defense to a new department, which is the Department of Transport under Minister C.D. Howe, Clarence Decatur Howe. He was really worried about interests outside of Canada establishing passenger service routes in Canada. Um, so they were contemplating how to create a national air transport system to really safeguard Canada's interests. So he, he, he goes to James Richardson, who is obviously operating a very successful um, outfit with routes all across Canada, and starts asking about 
asking him about his operations. And he gives Richardson uh, really the idea that Canadian Airways could potentially form the backbone of this new national framework. Uh, in a lot of his writings, he, he tells Richardson that Canadian Airways will be the chosen instrument for establishing a national airline. So Richardson really trusts him and, and works very closely with Howe and essentially shares, him, shares with him a lot of um, trade secrets for how Canadian Airways had become the largest aviation corporation in Canada. And, you know, they'd obviously, they'd already established mail routes, um, passenger carrying service, and Richardson really believed that Canadian Airways would become Canada's sole national um, and then, as an extension, international airline. Uh, that was recommended to uh, the Prime Minister, but um, somehow that didn't get communicated necessarily in uh, the government, and essentially nothing came of it. So, unfortunately, because Richard, sorry, because I was assuring Richardson that his aviation company is become, going to become this chosen instrument, Richardson decides, well, I better expand and change my company so that it can really um, operate this entire service. So he goes and he buys these Lockheed Electras to establish service. Um, he hires more pilots. Um, this particular aircraft this is the Lockheed Model 10 Electra. And he buys two of them and uh, he gets them painted in Canadian Airways uh, insignia and he starts a regular passenger service from Seattle, Washington to Vancouver in late 1936. Uh, I don't have a photo of them in Canadian Airways livery unfortunately because they were not in Canadian aviation liveries particularly long. Um, so Richardson sent about 10 copies of his business plan to Ottawa uh, with really detailed information of uh, a whole 48 kilometer air carrier system using 12 Lockheed Electras. Um, and then when he asked for the return of them, uh, he only got uh, one, all but one. Uh, and they, were, they, they kept delaying saying, oh yeah, we'll, we'll send this business plan back. Obviously, uh, they took that and they blatantly copied it. So Howe at this time was really starting to favor a Crown, Corpor Crown Corporation model, uh, essentially following Britain's, Britain's example, which is Imperial Airways. So to do that, uh, the Canadian government would subsidize the capitalization and operations of the airline, uh, and any deficit that it incurred in its first two years of operation was covered by Ottawa under the terms of the Trans-Canada Airlines Act. Richardson, on the other hand, had proposed um, essentially creating the service and assuming all of that liability himself. So it let the taxpayers off the hook. He stipulated that his airline would cover all of the capitaliza capitalization costs, any operational developments, um, and limit any potential profits to protect consumers from price gouging. So it was a very extremely generous offer um, in very difficult financial times in the middle of the Great Depression which the federal government decided to ignore. So C.D. Howe's Trans-Canada Airline Bill called on the railways, uh, so Canadian National and Canadian Pacific, each to put up $2.5 million for three seats each on a nine-member board, with the other three seats appointed by the federal government. So Canadian Pacific flatly refuses immediately because they argue that Canadian National Railways, which is a crown corporation, is essentially the same thing as the federal government. So why would they spend money uh, to have a very minority share on this board and have absolutely no control over the airline? So Howe goes to Richardson and offers him a 49% buy-in. But Richardson refuses for similar reasons and argues that, like, why would he buy into this? He's 100% ready to start the service. He's already got the, these, these electors that are starting regular Vancouver-Seattle flights. Um, so obviously his is the better solution. Howe decides, nope, uh, he creates Trans-Canada Airways. So it's uh, created by Canadian National Railways and it launches its first flight on September 1st, 1937 on a flight between Vancouver and Seattle. So they take Canadian Airways' entire business plan, they poach a whole bunch of key per personnel from Canadian Airways uh, and formed Trans-Canada Airlines as a government-run organization. And Richardson was 
immediately uh, extremely disappointed and crushed by this. Uh, he really felt personally betrayed by how uh, all of the all of Howe's assurances that Canadian Airways would be the national air service provider proved to be you know completely bunk. And because he had um, kind of a, a sense of pride and a sense of decency, uh, he didn't really want to kind of publicly protest this particularly strongly uh, or through the courts, which meant that that left Canadian Airways um, very vulnerable. So Trans-Canada Airlines took off very rapidly. Um, Canadian Airways immediately started running into a lot of trouble and essentially broke Richardson's heart. So he'd been a really vigorous person uh, and immediately after this development, he experienced a lot of health problems and exhaustion and died suddenly in June of 1939. Arguably, arguably of a broken heart. So around the same time that TCA is getting off, off uh, off the ground, Mackenzie Air Services in Edmonton starts regular flights between Edmonton and Great Falls, Montana. So international flights uh, in this Beechcraft Stagger Wing, BBB, uh, which immediately upsets Howe's Department of Transport. So the DOT orders Mackenzie Air Services to stop, and very shortly after, TransCanada Airlines takes over this route. So by 1938, Hangar 2 here in Blatchford is under construction, and it's about 60% larger than Hangar 1. It's 100 by 134 feet, uh, whereas Hangar 1 was 80 by 100 feet. But in order to get TCA service to Edmonton, cities need to provide three gravel runways of at least 3,000 feet long, 100 feet wide, um, which Ottawa, Ottawa will subsidize the cost of 25%. So um, for this scheme, the airport doesn't have enough room to grow. Uh, and at the time, 118th Ave is cutting across the area. So they need to expand from about 320 acres to almost 600 acres. And they decide that, well, the only reason, the only way to do this is uh, remove Alberta Avenue from the middle of the airport. Uh, it's a very controversial decision, it goes to city council, it's a very heated debate, and the mayor ends up breaking a 5-5 tie, and they close it. So that's the reason that the airport goes down to Kingsway and up Princess Elizabeth. Originally, 118th actually cut all the way through, and the original airport and uh, the hangars are actually built north of 118th. The funny, tragic thing is, originally TCA was actually not even going to be coming to Edmonton at all. So they were going to be operating a coast-to-coast -coast service, a single airway service, uh, with their hub in Lethbridge. Uh, but the thought of private feeder airlines making money, uh, they decided this was not a good idea. And so they decided that TCA should expand the service and cover these feeder airlines. Uh, they also go to the cities and they demand exclusive use of their own hangar. Uh, but they decide they're, they're not going to pay for it. They do agree to assign a five-year lease with an annual rent of 11% of the cost. Um, although they, they say that the cities have to be responsible for the maintenance and insurance um, entirely. So the city goes ahead and builds Hangar 3, which is a little bit smaller than Hangar 2. Uh, it has enough room for two Lockheed Electras or Lodestars, um, or three uh, with a squeeze. So the inaugural mail flight uh, from Edmonton is on October 1st, 1938. Uh, and this is a rare photo that shows all three of those first three hangars together. Uh, on the other hand, I mean, we got off a little bit easy in Edmonton. Uh, Calgary's airport was not, there was no room to expand Cal Calgary's airport for TCA service. So they ended up having to build an entirely new airport, uh, which is what led to the creation of Calgary's airport. This is a bit later photo from 1943. Um, it's showing uh, the air, obviously quite a lot of expansion at the airport, uh, but this is Hangar 1, Hangar 2, uh, and Hangar 3. And you can see here, this is 118th Ave, and it cuts down on Kingsway here. But originally, 118th actually cut across the airport. So Hangar 1 was built up here, as was Hangar 2, and all of the airport was north of 118th Ave. In 1939, uh, United Air Transport changes their name to Yukon Southern Air Transport. And McConaughey is wanting to expand the service, uh, mainly to service British Columbia and the Yukon. Uh, but he doesn't have the aircraft to do it. So he first goes to Chicago to buy a fleet freighter. He starts it up and it immediately catches fire. Uh, 
luckily uh, he just got an insurance on it and, and the insurance was able to pay it off his next trip he's in Vancouver and uh, while he's there an RCF hurricane loses control on the ground and crashes into the Ford Tri-Motor destroys it um, and he gets $57,000 for insurance so he finds out that Canadian Car and Foundry has three Barclay Grows, which are capable eight passenger aircraft. And he decides, you know what, those, those would make a good aircraft for uh, my Yukon Southern Air Transport operation. So he goes to CCNF uh, and says, I, I'd like to buy these aircraft. I'd like to get, get them off your hands. I think they'd be particularly useful for my airline, but I'm, I'm broke. So what kind of deal can you offer? So Canadian Car and Foundry comes back with a, a reduced price and, and he takes a look at it and he says, no, I, I don't think you understand. I, I literally have no money. So yeah, you're gonna have to do better than this. And they puzzled, they go back, they change the price and he looks at it again and he says, no, no, like honestly, I have no money. So he ends up walking away with an agreement with Canadian Car and Foundry to buy these aircraft for a dollar each as a down payment with the agreement that he's going to pay a thousand dollars a month for each plane uh, and this is by far the the craziest deal in uh, Edmonton's aviation history because very shortly after that Canadian Car and Foundry starts ramping up their wartime operations and switching to wartime production and they seem to forget to collect the money from Grant McConaughey so he gets all three Barclay Grows for a buck each uh, the Barclay Grow uh, it, you could convert it from wheels to skis to floats pretty quickly uh, and this particular aircraft was designed from a US Bureau of Air Commerce design competition in August of 1935 for a 6-8 to passenger twin engine monoplane uh, and the aircraft that were designed for this competition all look very similar so that includes the Model 12 Electra Jr, Beechcraft's Model 18 and the Barclay Grow so they're all twin tail twin engine aircraft. The Barclay Grow on the other hand has a really complicated honeycomb structure in the wings um, and fixed landing gear. Um, the wing structure was very very strong but very complicated um, and the landing gear because it didn't have the uh, it, it did save weight though uh, not having a, a, a large spar and the landing gear not being retractable was also lighter uh, letting the aircraft carrier heavy loads so it was definitely capable as a bush plane, but the other aircraft ultimately proved more popular because of their retractable landing gear. Uh, they were much more, they were seen as much more modern, uh, and so sales for these Barclay Grows stalled. They only ever made 11 of them, uh, seven of which came to Canada. Uh, and so these three Barclay Grows, so Yukon Queen, which is BLV, the one in the museum, which is on loan from the Aerospace Museum, or the Hangar Flight Museum, sorry, in Calgary. Uh, he starts service um, between Whitehorse, Vancouver, and Edmonton. And a one-way trip from Edmonton to Whitehorse took nine hours and cost $85, which is about $1,500 today. Uh, as part of this route, he added in uh, two-way radios and radio direction finders along the route, making uh, those making Yukon Southern the first commercial aircraft in Canada to operate with um, radio direction finders uh, and that kind of equipment. Uh, our BLV, uh, our Barclay Grove, ended up serving with Yukon Southern, Canadian Pacific, um, Associated, and Pacific Western Airlines, and it crashed in 1960 in Peace River. Thankfully, it was restored. There's only three Barclay Grows left in the world, and ironically, all three of them are in Alberta. So Calgary has one, we have one that's on loan from Calgary, and the third one, which is the prototype Barclay Grove, is in the storage facility at the Reynolds Museum in Wetaskiwin. So here's a picture of uh, the Barclay Grow when it came to the Alberta Aviation Museum uh, before we put the wings on it, showing that really complicated honeycomb structure on the inside of the wing. Uh, these are a few later photos um, from the mid-1940s with uh, when the Barclay Grow was with Canadian Pacific. And obviously the aircraft in the museum today. So that essentially takes us up to 1939. Edmonton has three hangars. Uh, they have gravel runways because of uh, this expansion with Trans Canada Airlines. Um, 
we're going to skip though and go overseas. We're going to talk about Canadians that um, couldn't find work as pilots in the mid 1930s, so they ended up going to the RAF uh, because the RAF had jobs. So we'll talk about early Canadians in the RAF and then the Canadian squadrons, Canadian fighter aces, ferry pilots, all that kind of stuff. Uh, so that'll be in July. In August, we're going to be coming back to Edmonton, uh, resuming kind of where we left off, and talk about how uh, even though the airport had, had started expanding in the 1930s, it was really the Second World War that developed the airport as we see it. I was going to say that we see it today, but uh, I would say that we saw it in 2013 before it closed. So it's the war that really expands the airport. They build tons of hangars. Um, they establish training bases for the British Commonwealth Air Training Plan. The Americans move in, uh, ferrying aircraft to the Soviet Union. Mackenzie Air Services operates aircraft repair, which ex expands greatly during the Second World War and employs a couple thousand people. So we'll talk about um, essentially all of that local history in August. Uh, and then in September, we're going to be talking about the Cold War, Edmonton's role in the Cold War, and Edmontonians that served in the Cold War. Uh, and then in September, we'll come back and talk about Bush operations in the late 40s and 50s and the development of those Bush airlines into larger regional airlines, more specifically Pacific Western Airlines. Uh, and a lot of smaller companies, local companies like Associated Airways and Tommy Fox and, and all that kind of stuff. So I will see you all next month.